Well, I want to thank B&H, David Brommer, Deborah Gilbert, and Howard Gottfried for inviting me to speak. And I want to thank you all for coming, despite thunderstorms, lightning, and whatever. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'll briefly introduce myself. I have been in photography for over 30 years, and I've done, I've done various things with photography as well as being a photographer. <clears throat> for most of that time, I did fine art, but I've also done advertising which I did in the late 80s through the early 90s. I did pharmaceutical advertising that was in the studio using big cameras and we still used film. It was interesting at that point in the early 90s, I began to see the handwriting on the wall where you know, I saw that film was going to disappear, which indeed it did. And I went back to school to learn Quark, Illustrator, and Photoshop. So I've been studying Photoshop since 1992. Uh, it's a long time now, it's like 20 years. I know it's hard to believe. Um, so, and I also studied graphic design. So in my years doing photography, I did not always earn a living with photography. So I've been a graphic designer. And by the year 2000, I decided to go digital. So I've been digital now for 12 years. I was very happy to give up my dark room for the computer and work in the light. Although I do miss the smell of fixer every now and again. <laughs> and, you know, I really, isn't that the Really. Um, so this is, this is all digital work, but I didn't start doing macro until 2005. And we'll get to that in a little bit. I've exhibited widely nationally and internationally. I am in the collections of both the Cincinnati Art Museum and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, although at the Met, it's not on the wall. It's in a drawer somewhere, but it is there. Um, and I've been published in Art News, uh, Focus Fine Art Magazine, like that. And just recently, in 2011, I um, got a first place Outstanding Achievement Award for one of my photographs, which I will show you. And I have been shortlisted on the Sony World Photography Awards in the Nature and Wildlife category. So that's kind of um, a little bit about me. And my presentation here today is going to be on macro photography and mostly botanicals, a little bit of wildlife. I do do other things. I do street photography, I do abstracts, and I also like to do food, raw food, as in hamburgers that are still on the hoof, lamb chops that are still walking around, and, and you know, fish that are still swimming, and things like that, which you can see on my website. But for today, we're going to stick to macro photography. So what is macro photography anyway? Well, according to Wikipedia, macro photography refers to photographing very small subjects and reproducing them very large. There's also another part to it. It means that you have to focus close enough so that when you reproduce it on, say, a four inch by six inch print, the reproduction of your subject is life size or larger. So those are the classic definitions. Did we lose something? There we go. OK, probably just went to sleep. So let's talk a little bit about lenses. Classic or real macro lenses have a reproduction ratio of one to one. Do we all know what that means? What it means is that your subject, the ratio of your subject to the subject on your image sensor plane is one to one. Or in other words, if you're photographing the head of a hornet and it's one inch in real life with a classic macro lens, it will be one inch on your subject plane. Fake macro lenses, on the other hand, like your macro zooms, have a ratio of one to three. So what does that mean? That means if, you're, if the head of your hornet is one inch, it's only going to be a third of an inch on your image plane or on the film, if anybody is still using film. Well, what does that mean for you as a photographer? 
if you're using your fake macro lens, you might want to get closer. But then again, if it's a hornet or an ant or a scorpion or a snake, that might not work for you terribly well. But a macro zoom has an advantage of that it's a much longer lens. So you can get much further away. Which is also helpful in the sense that the more distance you have, the more depth of field you have. I think most of you know when you're looking at macro photographs, there's a very, very narrow depth of field. The part that's in focus tends to be very short. <clears throat> so the further away you get, the more depth of field you have. Another issue with lenses is that to do macro photography, you need a lot of light. And of course, the more wide open your aperture is, say at f2.8 or 3.5 or f4, um, of course, the less will be in focus. So you do want to use a smaller aperture. And then you have the problem that you need more light. Um, fill flash is good. If you're doing a studio setup, you might want to have a ring light. I myself use fill flash. I do not use a tripod. A tripod is a good idea if you're Go, if you're in the studio, obviously you'll use a tripod. If you're out in the field, that's up to you. At some of the gardens, and I photograph in uh, most of the public gardens in New York City, inside the conservatories, you're not allowed to have a tripod. So I just never use one. I own one. I just basically don't use it. So that's, that's the story with the lenses. Um, now the difference between a macro zoom lens and a, tele, and a regular telephoto lens is that with a macro zoom, you can get a lot closer, much, much closer than you can with a normal telephoto lens. They are also manufactured <coughs> where the lens is slightly flatter. And you want this because this will give you more sharpness at the outer edges. So it depends what kind of work you want to, want to do as to what lens you'll choose. If you want to go out in the field, if you want to go to the gardens, and you want to get the magnolia trees in bloom, and then go inside the conservatory and get um, you know, a very small flower, a macro zoom works really, really well. I have a macro zoom, I have two fixed macro lenses, and often going to the gardens, I will take one of each, depending upon the season, what I think I want to shoot, and like that. So you have a number of choices. And also you can, in a way, the way I first started is just go out with a normal telephoto and see what you get good for, <coughs> flowering trees, and things like that. And I just have one story before I get into Enchanted Earth. Um, I was at the garden one day. This was before I had acquired all my fixed macro lenses. And all my equipment is Nikon, by the way, which it has been for the last several decades. Oh, and, and another digression. Canon says macro and Nikon says micro. Does anybody know the difference? basically essentially correct. I remember years ago asking a couple of photographers, uh, you know, what's the difference between macro and micro? And I got all these explanations, well, the lens is ground this way and the elements are put together that way and, you know, nothing made any sense to me and I finally looked it up. It seems that in the late 70s, Nikon was manufacturing both lenses for microscopes and they were coming out with, with their macro lenses and they didn't want them to be confused. So the macro lenses became micro. Canon says macro and Nikon says micro. It's a little like tomatoes, tomatoes, that's, that sort of thing. So there's, there's no difference. So for argument's sake, let's just say the rules of macro photography go something like this. You have to be very close up, usually within inches. It's a very small subject that's going to be reproduced, life size, or larger. 
you have an extremely short depth of field and a very limited focus area. So again, to go back to the story about being at the garden with, I was in the, the desert room and I was trying to take one of the desert plants and next to me was a guy with big Nikon and he was on a tripod and he's looking at me very curiously and I'm trying to take this picture and he's going, no, 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 you just, you, you can't do that, you know? And I said, oh, okay. And he said, well, you have a Nikon? He had a Nikon, took off his lens, put it on my camera. I took the picture, which I'll show you later. Next day, ran right out and got a macro lens. <laughs> so, um, and I used both Nikon and Tamron equipment, which works really well for me. Now, one of the things I want to say about macro, which has nothing to do with lenses, is that one of the reasons I really like it is it's a very intimate experience. I mean, I do a lot of botanicals as opposed to insects um, or objects with macro. And I like the fact that you just have to get so close that you just start to see things you've never seen before in the life cycle of the plants, the teeniest, tiniest insects, you know, it's not bees or wasps or, you know, like that, other things. The little hairs on the buds, um, all these different parts of the flower, and everything else disappears, and it's just you contemplating the subject. So that's one of the things that I really like about it. And now I will tell you how I got into the Enchanted Earth Project. Um, and I've, I've done some books. And this has been going on since 2005. I mean, if anybody had told me even 10 years ago that I would have been photographing nature, I would have said, you're absolutely crazy. I grew up in New York City. I was not a nature person. I had never been to the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens, and I've lived here most of my life. So nature just didn't enter into it. I had photographed models. I had done a lot of studio photography. I didn't even do a lot of street photography. I did a lot of setting up of fantasies and photographing that type of thing. But there, there were a lot of events, and one of them was 2011. It was after the events of 2011 that I devoted myself to photography full time. There were a lot of reasons for that, and one of them, of course, was that I had been a graphic designer. And graphic design and advertising were two of the industries that totally tanked after 2011. I mean, advertising, budgets, disappeared. <laughs> yes. Thank you, but it wasn't right. 9-11, sorry about that. That, you know, those were two of the industries that totally tanked after 9-11. Um, and I lost my job. After that, given certain circumstances, I decided now is really the time to devote myself full time to photography. So that's what I did. In 2005, my father was dying. And it was taking him a very long time to do this. It, in fact, took eight days. And while I knew that this event was imminent, I just didn't know how to distract myself. And a friend suggested that I take my camera and visit the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. I'd never been there before. So I went. It was early spring. It was the end of March. It was cold. It was gray. It was windy. But as soon as I set foot in the gardens, I started to feel peaceful. At least the sun was shining. It was not pouring. And with my camera, I was getting up close to a lot of the trees that were budding, uh, things just beginning to turn green. And right then and there, I said, OK, I'm looking for a project. I am going to go to the garden at least once a week, every week, for as long as it took. 
So I went when it was freezing and I went when it was hot. But of course, you know, the garden has a lot of rooms with very controlled environments. Okay, there are bathrooms, there are cafeterias. And by the way, I just make a note that the chili at the Bronx Botanical Garden is really, really good. If you go, get it with the works. It's really good. <laughs> so that's what I did. After two years, and I was pretty faithful to this. I was very disciplined about it, and I had acquired my macro lenses. I had a show, and I did a book called Enchanted Earth. And uh, just to let you know, Enchanted Earth was coined by Charles Darwin on one of his trips to the Galapagos Islands. But that's also the way I felt about the gardens, that the earth there was enchanted with all the beautiful, wonderful things that were grown there. So the project, even though it culminated in a book and a show after two years, and I stopped for a little while, um, I've been drawn back to the gardens. I can't stop. So this is now an ongoing project. And I have been to some wilder places. I've been to Hawaii. For example, I've been to Green Book Sanctuary in New Jersey. And I also want to say that pictures are everywhere. They're in the streets of New York, they're in community gardens, they're in friends' gardens, they're in the public gardens. I mean, it's just everywhere. So while I think it's absolutely wonderful if you can travel and go to exotic places, your subjects are literally in the backyard or the front yard or the cracks in the sidewalk. So with that, let's look at some pictures. That particular leaf, plant, whatever, is called a jade vine. And that's just a single part of it. And the thing in the center is a drop of water. So that's how close you can get. There will be another picture where you'll see much more of the vine. Early sunflower from a community garden. Middle sunflower. This is one of the most alien sunflowers I've ever seen. It was also growing in a community garden. And the other thing I want to say about this is I did not drop out the background. That was not a Photoshop thing. It was a gray, overcast, cloudy sky. And I had a very low angle. It also turns out it was shot at like F36, and I used fill flash. Why, I don't remember, but I did. And that accounts for you know it's, it, the sharpness. The other thing I like to do in Photoshop is I like to use high contrast. I use a lot of ca clarity in camera raw, which will bring out the weaker colors and will intensify the edges. And the edges, when you have a lot of contrast along the edges, is something that will give you a three-dimensional effect. That's a late sunflower. That poor thing was a result of the tornado that went through Corona in Queens. And it was in somebody's front yard. But I also felt that even in depth, the forms, the color, the angles, the details were totally fascinating. And you know, you can see all the little hairs there. Which is something else that's interesting about photographing botanicals. I like to photograph the whole life cycle. You know, it's not just the instant of maturity when the flower is absolutely perfect. I like to photograph the beginning, the buds, the seeds, the, the perfection, and the decline as well. And there's something about that that relates to my own life and my own life cycle. So which was part of going to the gardens once a week, every week, um, for years. I had a particular route 
I spent four hours every afternoon, morning or afternoon. I visited the same plants. I wanted to see how they changed over time in their relation to the environment, in their relation to the garden, and so forth. That's an orchid, a lady slipper. It's a very tiny plant. And I wanted here too, and you'll see this throughout my work, I try different angles. It's not just a question of saying, oh, this is an orchid, let's just put it in the frame. It's about more than that. It's also about the light. What kind of light is hitting the flower? What is it illustrating? That's also an orchid, and that one was at the Brooklyn Bo Botanical Gardens behind glass. And I was a little bit leery about trying to photograph something behind glass, but in this case it worked. Okay, here is where we illustrate depth of field. There's practically zero. It's just along this one tiny little plane. This is an orchid. But I felt that the combination of that tiny plane of sharp focus and the blurriness of the rest of it said something about the elegance of the flower. Also, I have to say that um, in doing things where not everything is in focus, as long as there's something the, uh, the eye will be attracted to that and will be grounded by the part that's in focus and understand the whole subject and the whole picture. Another orchid, and this one is titled Mouth because <laughs> that's kind of what it looks like to me with those big yellow teeth. And in fact, I think the flower thinks that too because it wants to attract insects to pollinate it. But also, you can see this one's starting to fade around the edges, which doesn't bother me at all. It just kind of says, you know, hey, I'm human, I'm a flower, I'm getting older. That's another orchid. Um, it's actually a tiger orchid. Of course, I called it leopard orchid because then, you know, it's got spots. It, looks more like that to me. What intrigued me, it's a hanging plant, and they're very, very small. What I found intriguing was the way the light came through parts of it and illuminated, you know, that's, that, that central part, because it, part, because it was coming in from behind. And those are your more ordinary orchids that you see in every uh, flower store, but these, this was during the orchid show at um, the Bronx Botanical Garden, which this year was a little disappointing. And I think all the gardens are feeling intense budget cuts because some of the exhibits are not as lush and wonderful as they've been in the past. That's probably the only setup in this entire show. And that was when I was at a friend's house, wonderful, spectacular house in Hawaii, where uh, we took a lot of orchids and put them out on the lanai. Um, and there was a lot of light coming in. And these were, you know, really teeny tiny things. And I took a lot of shots, but this is the only one that I felt really expressed what I was feeling and seeing at the time. That's another lady slipper. I like this particular photograph a lot. I mean, the, the, the orchid here is perfect. It's one of the few, and at the time it was truly perfect, and it was way down on the ground, and I was down on my knees, um, but I got the shot. That's a pretty new one. This was at the orchid show just this past February, March, at the Bronx Botanical Garden. And I see myself kind of going off in even another direction. I mean, to me, this is, starts to have a totally abstract quality. Um, it could be a flower. I mean, maybe it could be something else. And I kind of like that. I like to see 
the way I evolve as well as all the plants. Spider orchids, and that was also in Hawaii. <coughs> Anthurium, which is one of my least favorite plants. Very difficult to photograph. What I like about this one was that I was really able to get close enough to get that extraordinary detail with the yellow and the green and this, the, the way it was situated with this big red cape-like form in the back of it. So to me, this is not just a regular anthurium. It goes a bit beyond that, takes it a little bit further. A climbing pandanus. And by the way, I, I don't know a lot of the Latin names. I try learning them more and more as I go. But that's, that's not my primary focus. And this particular plant in a tropical room at the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, I have been photographing literally for years. And most of the shots for me had been really boring. This is the first time I was able to get it so that you could see the green buds or whatever they are in the center of the flower and it has a little bit of water on it. This was using a flash. Yes? The flash that I use is the, the little pop-up flash on my Nikon D300. I have a speed light, but again, I don't use it. I like to go out with minimal equipment, the lightest equipment, just whatever I can carry. I don't like to be encumbered with a lot of things. I don't want to have to put equipment on and take it off. I like to move around very freely. Um, this one with a little pop-up flash. I believe I had my Tamron macro lens. I have an 18 to 270 Tamron macro, which I like a lot. I really do like it a lot. Passion flower. And here I'm going to have to say that the f-stop was probably below f8. It was probably more like 5.6, 6.1. <clears throat> and again, there is a very, very narrow area of focus. But this was also a passion flower kind of on its way out. I believe this is a blue or periwinkle hydrangea. And the, that actual part of the plant has got to be less than half an inch. It's very, very small. Uh, one of the things I really like about this picture is the color. I mean, it's that blue that just gets you. It's somewhere in between that and that. Peonies. May peonies. A couple of years ago. Roses. The, the Bronx Botanical Garden, actually it's the New York Botanical Garden, I always remember it as the Bronx, has an incredible rose garden. Actually, the Brooklyn does also, and they bloom mostly June, July. They start to fade in August and come back the late ones in September. What attracted me to this was all those edges that kind of looked as someone came along and you know, kind of painted all those edges. In fact, it's the, the flower has begun to die. And that's what produced the edges. This is that jade vine where you saw the single plant. And <clears throat> again, it's more of that color than that color, somewhere in between the two. But it just knocks you over. I don't know the name of this flower, but it's about this big. Um, and it grows at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. When you <coughs> excuse me, walk into one of the conservatories, it's, it's, it's kind of right there at the front. And it's very, very small. So here, the only thing that's in focus are the actual little tips of the flower. And it looks like fireworks to me. And then six weeks later, it looks like a bowl of spaghetti.
This is a new one. Um, in March, there was one spectacular summer day in the middle of March where it was like 80 degrees and everything was blooming when it wasn't supposed to. This was um, at one of the gardens and these are the lilacs. These are the lilac trees that should have been blooming in April and this was the middle of March so it was still early but you can see with a macro lens and I'm, this was probably my 90 millimeter Tamron you can see all this fuzz all over these little buds and I thought you know it looks like they're frosted kind of and I just found that totally fascinating I mean you know I'd never seen that before never got close enough to really examine it and all this stuff on the leaf did you, did you see yes It's not that you get the sharp edges, it's just that with the clarity slider in camera raw, it emphasizes, it brings up some of the weaker colors and it emphasizes the contrast. And what gives you some of the sharpness in the edges is the contrast between light and dark colors. This is another shot of lilacs that was taken um, some years before the first one when the lilacs were a little further along. This was um, a different lens that might have been um, also a Tamron, it might have been an 18 to 250 lens. And I was just concentrating on getting that part of the flower which was just beginning to open and of course the color I mean I find that you know the color of the lilacs just extraordinary and I like to capture that and um, in Photoshop I don't saturate occasionally I might bring up the vibrance but again I do everything in camera raw and if you're digital um, it would be good to shoot in camera raw and you can play with the white balance or adjust the white balance. And there are many things you can do. I mean, it, you, you all know as you change the exposure, it's going to change the color. Another thing that I do um, in Photoshop is I work with curves. And many times I will just hit auto on curves just to see what the computer thinks the curve should be as to what I think the curve should be and very often it gives me a better picture. Sometimes the computer is right, sometimes I'm right. Uh, I have a question about yes. this particular picture. Yes. There are many times you take the picture because you want the subject but then you have unwanted other things that gets into your image. So do you crop or do you let it go or what did the decision at the end? Okay, the question is, if there are unwanted parts of the photograph, do I crop or do other things? The answer is yes, I will crop if I think the picture needs to be cropped. If there is some artifact either on the plant um, or from the photography that I find distracting, I will get rid of it. I try to leave as much as possible. I try to compose as much as possible in the camera, which is always a good idea. It's less work at the other end. But if necessary, I will do whatever's necessary. And that was in the cactus room. I call it fuzzy. And it reminds me for some reason of mint ice cream, but you know, there it is. A, a butterfly, is that I, what it is? I took that picture and I had that in the show and I had to find out what it was called. Oh, okay. Well, so now we know it's a butterfly bush. And that's actually a, the, kind of the blooms. That part is blooming. That was a very early one. Here's something else. I, I included these because I also photograph vegetables along with, with the food. I like to photograph vegetables and I go to various open air markets in New York City. <clears throat> there's one in Union Square, there's the New Amsterdam market at the seaport and they have beautiful vegetables. 
And sometimes they're displayed a little more creatively and imaginatively than the supermarkets. So I like the photograph there. And this is a gourd that I found there. Now we're back to succulents. And this one, first of all, I like the color, all these pastel colors, all that kind of aqua. And I did use flash on this, even though the plant was sitting in sunlight, in plenty of sunlight. I did use the flash. And in this case, I think the flash really helps because now you have an abstract pattern, the dark and the light. It's not just the plant. It's about the light. It's what you do with it. I'm, I'm sorry, you I can't. Want more about Using the flash. Uh, the question is, how do I use the flash? Well, obviously, if you if you're in one of the conservatories, for example, and it's not a brilliant sunlit day, and you're four inches from the flower, and you shoot it at say f8 at 1 25th and the thing is totally underexposed, then you know you're going to have to use flash. And one thing to always remember if you're doing outdoor work and indoor work is to remove your sunshade when you use your flash indoors. Because if you don't remove the sunshade, you're going to have a shadow. So that's something to remember. I've forgotten this enough times that I want you to try and remember. Also, <clears throat> while we're talking about that sort of stuff, if it's very cold outside, say it's 32 degrees, and then you want to go into the tropical room, <laughs> have a plastic bag with you. Otherwise, you know you're, you're going to get condensation on your lens. And one of the things they did, <clears throat> excuse me, is I found these fog eliminator cloths. So I thought, this is going to solve my whole problem. I was really excited. So before I left for the garden, I took my fog eliminator cloth, and I rubbed my lens, and everything looked terrific. And I went to the garden, and it wasn't so much of a problem going from the freezing cold into the tropical room. I get home, and I look at my pictures, and there are white streaks <laughs> across all the pictures. So that was a lot of Photoshop work. <laughs> so be careful of that. Uh, be careful of the condensation. And if, if, if you use cloths on it, be careful they don't streak the lens. Does anybody know what that is? Anybody want to take a get? Sorry? Romanesco. It's Romanesco which is a form of cauliflower or broccoli. I'm not sure. It might be a cross between the two. And this kind of looks like an underwater picture. OK, and here is a great example of when you focus on one plane with that narrow depth of field. And then in Photoshop, it's like you super sharpen parts of it but not all of it. And I use um, soft light with the, um, with the high pass. I do that pretty much on all my pictures. And that will give you that 3D effect, even though it's 2D. The high pass is a filter. But the soft light, the overlay, and the hard light are blending modes. So what you would do is put the picture on a separate layer, on a filled layer, with the whole picture on it. Then you would choose either soft light, overlay, or hard light, or vivid light. You never know. Then go up to the filter menu, scroll all the way down to high pass. That's going to bring up a dialog box with a slider that you can move up or down. And it's going to like mask everything in gray. Um, and then you have to put a mask on the layer, either black or white. And with a brush, you paint over it to reveal what you want to have that super sharpness.
tomatoes still on the vine. This was taken at a community garden in my neck of the woods, which is Astoria, Queens. And it was really low to the ground, and I was practically on my back trying to get this shot. And it's this one perfect tomato in that entire garden, because that year they experienced some sort of tomato blight, but I got the picture. And here, to, you know, what I, I mean, if you saw the garden, it was, it, it didn't really look like much. And one of the things that I love about macro is like, you're right there with the tomato. It's like you're another tomato on the vine and that's, that's your neighbor. It's a whole other world. And who would have ever known that tomato vines have all these little hairs on them and, uh, you know, the, just the way it grows, just the way it hangs there. Yes, question? Uh, what kind of metering do you use, normally use? In uh, the question is what kind of metering do I use? Whatever the camera tells me. Or, but you do spot or, <clears throat> or? No, um, I tend to set it on aperture priority. Yeah. Okay, so if I set it to f8, for example, I'm going to use what the camera gives me unless it tells me, oh, well, you know, we're at a 15th of a second, and then I'm not going to do it because it's going to come out all blurry. Yeah. Oh, matrix. Uh, the question is what type? Yes, I use matrix metering. And is there a particular photo lens that you like that you use more than any other? The question is what is my favorite focal length? And the real answer to that is 270 on my 18 to 270 macro zoom, the, the 270 um, or my 90 millimeter macro lens. Those are, those are my two favorite. For street photography, which I do as well, I tend to go more towards the 18 millimeter. Spanish dagger. Very large plant, but if you get really up close, you're going to see these amazing things. Look, look at the way the, you know, the edges here between the green and the brown and all this stuff hanging through it. And this little section makes it look monumental. Uh, <clears throat> That's the, the succulent or cactus plant that I told you about at the beginning, where the guy at the garden said, oh, no, 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 you can't take that with a telephoto lens. You need to use a macro lens. And I think he was right. I mean, you can see every little detail of the leaves. And that was not flash. That was sunlight that made those very hard shadows. So what we start to get here is a much more abstract kind of a picture. This is one of my favorites. It's a swamp milkweed. Do any of you remember as a little kid when they, you know, those little weeds that grew up and you blew the seeds all over the place? Well, that's what that is. So that seed right there is a fraction of an inch. And it was a freezing cold day. It was late in October, and it must have been about 20-odd degrees. But um, there I was, and that's what I got. And I just, I mean, I love it. I love all those little hairs that some are sharp and some are blurry, and that seed is about to fly away. <clears throat> this, again, was taken in the late fall. <clears throat> and some sort of mold or fungus or whatever had attacked the leaf, and again, it was about to fall anyway. But I just thought the colors were amazing. And whatever that is, I mean, it's, it's beautiful for whatever it is, even though you know it's not the moment of perfection. And of course, this demonstrates right here that you have practically zero depth of field. Kettle Pond, and that's your more or less typical fall picture. 
December hydrangeas. This is um, at the Central Park Conservancy Garden, which is on 105th Street and 5th Avenue. And what I liked about it was, well, of course, the color, the fading color, the contrast, you know, between the blue and the pink and the brown, um, knowing it's December and pretty soon the hydrangea is just going to be skeletal leaves. But th this is the transition. That's a fairly new one, too. I have no idea what that flower is. Sorry? Is it a bush? Was it a bush? No, no. I don't know what it is. But again, this was, to me, more about the light and the fact that, I mean, you have this little white flower, but look at that, the background, the beautiful colors there. Again, this was natural light. Echinacea um, at the Chelsea Piers. So, I mean, it can be everywhere. It could be the High Line, the Chelsea Piers. You just, you have to see it. You just see it. And, I mean, I love the fact that I could get so close that you could practically feel the head of that echinacea, you know, the texture of it. You, it's just wonderful. I had to throw that in because I think that's the only bug picture <laughs> I have. The dahlias with the bee. That's a magnolia. If any of you have tried to photograph magnolias, they're extremely difficult because it's like each petal, each flower, each branch is on a different plane so that you really have depth of field issues. But this one I was able to get close to and I liked it again because it, it, was, it was pretty perfect. So that was good. And it's the whole monotone of it, which I also liked. That's a fairly new one. That one is a flash picture. I don't know what it is. It's some sort of cactus succulent. And I just see here, to me, this is an example of where the flash really adds something to it. It adds that texture and the way that way the light shines. Camellia. But camellias are kind of round flowers. Um, I don't find them all that interesting, although I like this one because it was red and white. So I thought, well, why don't we try just a different angle instead of shooting it head on? Let's see what it looks like in profile. And I think it really works. Another camellia, and here too, I did not drop out the background. This was the Planting Fields Arboretum, and I saw an opportunity. This flower was against a window, and it was another one of those cloudy days. So I was able to, and I, and I was pretty far away from it. Um, I did use flash, I think, I don't remember, and just lightened the background, but it's not dropped out. a golden shrimp, which is another one of those plants. It grows on a bush, and there are lots of them. And they're not all that interesting. But this particular shot with that white glow behind it, kind of like a halo, I think makes the whole thing. Lobster claw. This was taken in Hawaii. <clears throat> And it's the only time I've gotten a lobster claw that I really like. <clears throat> kiku, the Japanese kiku or chrysanthemum, uh, there was, that was a whole show at the New York Botanical Garden. And these are kind of interesting because, again, these are another big blobby flowers. So how do you make them interesting? And the other problem was every single one of them was wired to keep them up, every single one. So probably that was the most Photoshop work, although with CS5 and you're content aware, it's, it's pretty simple. 
But for this, I did have to remove all kinds of circular wires that went around the plant. And I, I also used high contrast on this, although, I mean, it was a pink flower. And I think um, that helped it, the high contrast. <coughs> flower taken in a market, sitting in a bucket of water. Not that you need to know that, but you know, I'm telling you that so that you can see that you know, pictures, flowers are everywhere. Water hyacinth, very, very small, grows in these ponds. And without wading boots, you probably need um, a macro zoom to get it. This one is brand new. This one's only about two or three weeks old. Bird of paradise. Hard to find them when the whole flower is actually pretty good. Usually parts of it start to decay before the others. I have no idea what this is, if anybody knows. It was, it, it, it was, it's part of the Daubenese water lily. There was a tub at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden with the Daubenese water lily. It's not there anymore. Don't know what happened to it. But this is probably just before it starts growing, and I love the texture of it. It's, so it's mostly water, and the water gives you those shapes. And this is kind of this mucky stuff, but I think it makes a great abstract. And this is one of my signature pieces, the July Lotus. Again, what kind of makes this picture for me is the way the light has made this shape. So now we're coming to all the lily pond shots. And the lily pond is one of my most favorite things to photograph. Different times of the year, different times of the day, it's constantly changing. And here too, this is more about the light. It's more about, and the, there's no flash here. This is all the sunlight making those little points of light, changing the color of the leaves from green to this monotone. That's trying to get inside the water lily. And that was done last summer. <clears throat> that was on a day, it was just about to rain. So it was incredibly still, and it was incredibly overcast, which made a beautiful, even light. It's like the great soft box in the sky. A soft box is something you use in the studio. Um, to light models with. And here was like the cloud cover, was like the great soft box in the sky. It looks more like a painting. That was that same day. Here is another view of the lily pond in the sense that um, it's late in the season. Everything is starting to decay. But I wanted to look at the lily pond as a whole to see it as an abstract picture rather than the individual components. Now we're back to winter. Oh, now we, we come to the wildlife <laughs> portion of this presentation. Fas fascinated by the koi in the various koi ponds. And this particular winter, it was very, very cold. And the pond actually froze, because you don't see that all that much, especially like this past winter. Nothing would freeze. And it was interesting the way the ice kind of broke up and created these leaves. And the fish swam in the leaves. They didn't particularly go under the ice. They tended to swim through these little channels. That's in the fall. And yes, a polarizer is a very good idea if you're going to shoot the lily ponds at any time of the year. I did use a polarizer here. <clears throat> and obviously, the fish are under the water and under the leaf, but they all look like they're on the same plane. 
That's a big fish, a big koi. And he lives in the Bronx. And if you go to visit him, it's amazing. If you stand at the edge, these big fish will just come out from wherever they are. They see your shadow, and they swim right next to the edge, hoping they'll get fed. And that's my koi swimming through the galaxies of the world. These are my books. I've done two Enchanted Earth books. There's one there called What's for Dinner. They're available from Blurb. I gave you handouts so you can see all the addresses if you want to go to Blurb and visit the books. And that's my Enchanted Earth 3.0. And that's my info. I also want to mention that I do private tutoring in photography and particularly Photoshop. So if anybody is interested in that, contact me and we can talk about that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web 